Well, good morning, Skillman. It's good to be back with you all. I uh, hope you've had a good week. I have so enjoyed my time with you all. Uh, I do these church transitions an awful lot, and in the short time we've been together, I've really grown to love and appreciate you all so very, very much. Uh, you all have been kind and generous to me. You all have welcomed me in and have listened to some messages that have been both um, important and difficult. And when you share those conversations, uh, people form a bond together. Last week's lesson was not, a diff was not an easy one to hear. The report of the Congregational Health an Analysis was not easy. Uh, you all uh, heard it uh, clearly. Uh, your response has been uh, uh, very open and uh, affirming of that. I finished last week by saying we were gonna spend some time talking about options. Where do we go from here? And so that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk to you uh, as clearly and as kindly as I possibly can about uh, what I would see. Uh, a lot of times when people come to me for counseling or in consulting, uh, what they're asking me to do is to uh, be truthful to them and to also lay out as many options as I possibly can to them and then be honest with them about those options. Does that make sense? So there comes a point in time where it's, it's good to talk about where we are and what are the options as we move ahead. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to put on my uh, consultant's cap and I'm going to talk to you about options based on the congregational health assessment. At the very end, I'm going to take that cap off and I'm going to put on my theologian's hat. And I'm going to put on my minister's hat and I'm going to say something to you uh, 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 from a theological perspective, if I may. So that's where we're going this morning and I'll be moving rather quickly, so let's review. Uh, last week, we were talking about the Congregational Health Assessment, and we said, as we looked at the results, I'm going to ask that that slide be brought up now, there's going to be um, nine different areas of church health. And we said last week, basically, that six out of those nine are in distress, they're in the red zone, and three out of those nine areas need improvement. So the situation right now is one that needs attention, and it's going to have to have attention beginning right away. Uh, and the way I say that to, this to my clients is the recovery from this is, uh, I liken it to how do you pedal a bike uphill? Uh, is the grade flat? Is it somewhat uphill? Or is it going to be pedaling uphill to a degree? And this is pedaling uphill to a degree. There's work to be done and it has to start right away. The assessment said that we are an aging church about 71 percent or above the age of 55 and a significant number older than that so we're in elderhood a need to attract younger members we said it's a veteran church about 73 percent have been here 20 years or more so a long long time those that are involved are about one-third those that are moderately involved about a third and a lot of folks that are not involved so it would take a re-energizing of folks to get involved uh, there's been some discouragement over the last couple of years, which is to be expected, and so the culture and the climate of the church, we kind of need a reinfusion, um, some, some good stuff going on. So there's some work to be done. Uh, we'll move on from there. Let's talk about the positives for just a moment. The Skillman positives are many, and they're important, uh, and there's one in particular we'll refer to more in just a few minutes. But the positives include your legacy. Uh, you are a, a long-term church. I think, Shane, over 100 years old probably now. Um, you have a history in Dallas and are admired as a mother church to many other congregations and other Christians. So you have a deep loyalty from other folks. Uh, you are surrounded by a community that has resources and loves you very much here in Lakewood in this Dallas area. Uh, you have a Children's Discovery Center that has a great reputation here uh, and uh, is well loved by many, many community families. Uh, and two things from my vantage point. One is this past year 
uh, in 2022, you attempted uh, some adaptive change. You said, we're gonna do something different, and you made a launch at that. It didn't work, uh, but significantly, you made a run up the mountain, and most churches do not. So uh, God bless you. you, you made a stab at it, and that's tremendous. Most of the churches I work with do not do that deal. And so that's a really good sign. The other one I'll throw in that's an also a very good sign is you all have embraced this transition. Uh, you all are working with me, you're, you're trying to make this thing work, and we're working together, and we've got, I don't know, three or four months under our belt, and it's headed down the right track. So those are all good positives, and, uh, and, and we could build upon that, and we want to say um, good job on that. That's, that's really wonderful. Now, in terms of where we go from here in options, the first big thing I need to say to you is there's basically two categories of options that you as a church can discuss. Uh, the first category of options that we're going to talk at length about is um, the relaunching. Skillman stays here or Skillman has uh, a number of options we'll talk through to either stay and minister here or reconfigure itself in some other manner and relaunch itself. And so there are relaunch options that we're gonna talk about uh, in, in just a few minutes and, and walk you through what those might be and what, what that would involve. So those are the relaunch options that I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time talking to you about. There is a, another option, which is uh, wind down and end. Uh, the Skillman Church uh, sees the end of its time it does not, for a variety of factors, have the energy, the drive, uh, the resources needed to do a relaunch. And so there are churches that at this point in time do what's called uh, repurposing. Uh, they decide it is time to end their ministry, they liquidate their assets, and they repurpose those assets into new ways to minister. And so the church ceases to exist in that form, and it, it purposes its resources uh, other places. And so churches are making those decisions. Do we want to relaunch, or do we want to wind down and end? And, so there, and I would say there are many churches, not just Skillman, but many, many churches, uh, not just churches of Christ, but churches in general across the country, who are at this moment, at this fork in the road, uh, do we relaunch or do we repurpose? So we're going to walk you through this morning mostly relaunch options for you to think about uh, and then as a church talk to me, talk to the leadership about what you think in some focus groups which we'll talk about in a moment. At the very end I'll come back to this this repurposing and say a word or two about that. Let me mention three or four things that I don't think are options at this point in time. It's when, when I'm talking with my clients, uh, they always want to know, well, what can't I do? Or what do you not recommend? And so there's, what do I think are not very good options? Uh, number one, I don't think it's an option to uh, uh, deny that this is your reality. Uh, this, is, this is really the truth. If, if, if Skillman does not make a decision here within the next short period of time about relaunching or repurposing, uh, this church will not survive. Uh, you do not have the resources uh, to go beyond mm, mid-2025. Uh, let me say that again to be real, real clear, because just as one of our elders has said to me, waiting and seeing is not an option. Something must be done. And you can, in my estimation, make a decision about where you want to go from here and implement that this year. You can then use 2024 to get some momentum and get it on track and get rolling, and you will beat that 2025 deadline. But you will have used up all of your resources, your funds, uh, as well as people and time, uh, by mid-2025. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that to you, but that is reality. And you have to understand that that is a, that is a reality that cannot be fixed or moved. 
So denial and waiting and seeing is not an option for you all. And I don't know how to say that any clearer than I'm saying it to you right now. Number two, um, a second thing I do not recommend is magical thinking. Um, there is no magic wand that I have to pull out onto the wall and wave over this thing and suddenly it's all going to change. I grew up working in Churches of Christ in Dallas during the heyday of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, Waterview and South MacArthur and Highland Oaks and the churches around here where we had big programs and thousands of people and big mission programs and we were not struggling and when people got upset they just moved from church to church. We are not going to recapture the glory days of the past. Church work is going to be hard and we're all struggling. Even the healthy churches are struggling to stay healthy coming out of COVID. And so magical thinking that suddenly this is all going to go back to being the glory days of Skillman or any place else is simply not a reality for any of us. Number three, a quick hire. Uh, going out and hiring a new minister or hiring a staff real quick, I would not recommend for several reasons. Number one, there's a very, very small pool of preachers available. Number two, they're going to know very, very quickly that this church is in distress and they're going to want to know what your plan to deal with that is, which is what I'm asking you to do today is to build a plan. Number three, if you don't have a plan, they're going to come in and give you their plan and then you all will be fighting over your plan versus their plan. Does that make sense? I don't recommend that. I recommend you figure out where you're going and then go find the people that match up to that and can get you there. And that could be done. It'll take some work, but I think it could be done. But it's a little farther down the road. Number four that I don't recommend to you is polarization. I'm gonna share some things with you this morning and then I'm gonna turn the ball over to you because it's up to you all what you decide you need to do. And if you as a church can come to a unified decision on what direction you want to go, then uh, you can move forward, I think, combining energy. But if the conversation we're about to have leads to polarization, then that polarization will result in an ending of the church. Uh, you will not come together in time to put anything together. So we're going to have to see if we can speak in one voice to this. Does that make sense? Yeah. With that in mind, five options, five basic options to relaunching if we can. And you say, I'm not recommending one over another. You need to understand the price tag to any of these. And I'm going to talk at length about one in particular. Number one is downsizing. There are congregations at this point in time that determine that they need to downsize who they are and then move to a new building that is smaller, uh, downsize uh, their ministries, and many times focus them more on the community. So they get smaller and they get more specialized. I work with two congregations that have done this. The Quail Springs Church of Christ uh, did this in Oklahoma City. They were a massive, more community Church of Christ. They went through a downsizing and now a smaller church in Edmond. Uh, Highland Oaks here in Dallas has just done this. When I was working in Highland Oaks in 1989, 1990, we were a 3,000-member church. We lost 1,000 members in one year. And it continued that downward span until just recently. They sold that big building out on LBJ. They've moved to a smaller building that is, mm, I don't know, just a few blocks away from it there in Lake Highlands. And they're repurposing that building to go out and be a community church in Lake Highlands. So they've redone their bill. They're, they're not the old glory days of the Highland Oaks and the big thing. They've downsized and repurposing themselves. So your first option is you could downsize here, move to another facility, uh, use those assets from the sale of this ability to underwrite ministry, and then continue on that direction. That's your first option. Your second option relates to church plants a church plant partnership could be formulated. 
Uh, there are many churches here in the Dallas area, many churches in these neighborhoods that are new church plants. They're getting started, they've got a group of people, they've got a ministry, they've got some momentum, and they're looking to partner with somebody to expand their ministry and growth. Uh, the elders have already been approached by different groups over the last, I don't know, year or so uh, that would like to partner with you all. And there's different ways you can do that. Uh, you can partner by letting another group use some of your building and you meet here and they meet there and you parallel partner and that's an option. There are churches that parallel with churches to see if they would match up doctrinally and ministry wise and personality wise to see if that would move to more of a merger. And so you can do that as a particular option as well. The merger option is something that's been used a lot in Churches of Christ. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things to know going into that. W one is, uh, do we match up? It's kind of like dating. Uh, you go out with somebody and say, you know, do we kind of get along and do we get together and would we make a match? Uh, the other one is, generally, one group tends to be more dominant than another. And so as you merge with another church, generally who is ever is the strongest or has the more resources over time becomes the more dominant congregation. And so that church plant partnership is something that's available, it's out there, and you all can talk about that and explore that and be thinking about it. Option number three is what I call split the baby. You remember the story in the Old Testament where the two women came into Solomon and they had one baby and both those women were claiming it and they couldn't decide who owned it, so what did Solomon say? Hand me my sword. Yep, split the baby. There are churches that go through this discussion, this conversation at this point in time, and they polarize. Or they have very differing opinions about what should happen. And as a result, they cannot resolve those, and they decide to take the existing church, divide up the resources, and go their separate directions. A divide and conquer mentality. Uh, and it involves a little bit of conflict because people are disagreeing. Uh, it also involves multiple launches at the same time because you're not having one new launch, you're having two launches at the same time, which is difficult. Uh, but it can be pulled off. If you drive out um, to Irving, South MacArthur Church of Christ that I worked with in the 80s, uh, went through uh, a decline. They had a big 3,000 seat auditorium. Uh, they were rumbling around in there with just a few hundred people. And the Irving Public School System came along and offered them a big chunk of money uh, to buy that building. And so they looked around and said, I believe we'll do it. At that point in time, they had a disagreement. Some people wanted to be a community church and some people wanted to stay more traditional Church of Christ. So they split the baby. So today, as you drive out 183 on the south side, you'll see Christ Church, which is the old South MacArthur Church of Christ. And when I go over there, the, all my young couples are now not young couples anymore. <laughs> but that was a split the baby solution that worked for them. Does that make sense? So that split the baby is an option. Downsizing, partnering with church plants, splitting the babies. Number four is satellites. There's different terms for this, but satelliting is where one church uh, that is generally uh, weaker or in need of a reinfusion partners with another church that is stronger and has resources. And they compare the missions and they believe that the mission and the personality can match up and, uh, and a relationship can be formed. And so satelliting or franchising, whatever you want to call it, becomes an option. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this one because you all spent a great deal of time looking at this option uh, in the past, and so you're very familiar with what this particular option is. The thing you want to remember on the satellite option is that you want to talk to the satellite churches, not just the home church. 
because you won't be a home church, you'll be a satellite church. It's like when you go shopping for a house and you're looking at the model homes, you're not getting the model home, you're getting the build off of the model home. And so you want to visit satellite churches to see how does that feel for us. And number five is relaunching with help. Relaunching with help is where a church is lacking resources inside. We need to hook it up to some external IBs for a little while to infuse time and people, financial help, expertise, support around it. It rebuilds itself from the inside to where it can kind of come out of rehab and move back into full-blown ministry again. And relaunching with help uh, is something that has a unique opportunity here at Skillman that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. But it involves answering those, the, those key questions, which is, who are we going to be right here in this community in Lakewood with this group of people? And it's what I call the make it from scratch option. It is, we are going to start over. It is as if you have the history of the church as your foundation, but you take and you clear the decks and say, we're going to rebuild from here. So there are five options. Downsizing, partnering with the church plant, splitting the baby, satelliting, and relaunching with the help of other congregations and other people. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it would take to do that relaunch, but what I'd like for you to do is put those five options into your hip pocket and cook on them for a little bit. Be thinking about those things. Which one or ones of those seem to resonate with you? Because we'll hopefully need to come to some kind of unity around one of those if there is to be a relaunch. Let's take that last one, which is the relaunching with help. If that one were to be adopted, could we talk about what that would require? And I've been thinking about this a bit. Let me share. I think there are six ingredients, six ingredients to doing that. Number one is I'm going to call it a decision of the will. I was teaching my class in marriage and family therapy on Tuesday night, and I had a room full of potential marriage shrinks looking at me. Talk about a group of crazy people. And they asked the question, why do some people come to counseling and change and most do not? It's a good question, isn't it? Why do some people change and many do not? And the answer to that is very, very simple. The answer to it is not something magical going on on the part of the therapist. The answer to that is they made up their mind. Why do people change the conditions that they're in? Basically, in my 40 years of working with churches and clients, it's because the group makes up their mind. And so the first question, too, can we relaunch, is a question of will. Do you want to make up your mind to do that? And that's the big one. Because I work with tons of people, yes, in their 70s and their 80s that are facing great challenges, and they make up their mind, and they just flat do it. Because they made up their mind. Uh, we're watching the NFL playoffs here right now, and those of you who have been around Dallas long enough remember the days when the Dallas Cowboys were called next year's champions. Y'all remember that? On the road to their first Super Bowl, they were losing a bunch. And all those old veterans like George Andre and, and, and Bob Lilly were just so upset. And the press had given up on them, and the public had given up on them, and their coaches had given up on them. And Bob Lilly called a team meeting, and he said, look, everybody in town's given up on us, we're everybody's joke. 
we might as well buckle up our chin straps and go for it. Forget what the coaches say, forget what the media is saying, forget what everybody's saying, and let's just go out there and play ball and do it. And that's what they did. They made a decision of the will, and then they went to the Super Bowl because they just decided, we're in this alone, so we might as well go for it. I must tell you, I love that mentality. And when my clients come in and they sit down and they say, I know I'm facing terrible circumstances, but I'm going down swinging. Oh, I love that. Number two, the second thing that I would recommend to you is that you consider embracing the help that is around you, taking advantage of the help. There is unique help around uh, the Skillman Church of Christ. Because you all are highly esteemed by other churches here in the Dallas area, there have been churches and church leaders who have come forward over an extended period of time to our leaders and said, we love the Skillman Church of Christ. Skillman was instrumental in our start as a church or instrumental helping us or we've come from Skillman and we love it. And if there's anything we can do as a church to come alongside with Skillman to help it survive, we're there. And so what I'm saying to you this morning is you are not alone in this. There are other neighboring churches right around here who are ready to come in and come alongside with Skillman to provide expertise, uh, support, uh, additional leadership, people, money, resources, prayer. They basically said, we'll, we'll come in and come around you, not to take over. Uh, it's your decision to craft your vision, craft your ministry, decide where you're going. Your elders will still be you know, overseeing this church, but we want to build some resources around you, hook up another IB over the next couple of years to get you back on your feet. And if you all want that help, we're here to help you do that. I had one elder look at me, and he said, from another church, he said, Skillman has meant the world to me in my life. And he said, I would walk around to any eldership in this, in this town and tell them, you need to step up and help Skillman. He was dead serious about it. That's what you mean to other people. So what I would say to you is, I would say to you, consider taking the help that is available to you. I want to give you a passage on this one real quick. Paul tells the Galatians in chapter 6, I think about verse 2, he said, you'll remember this one, every one of us should bear one another's what? Burdens. Later in the paragraph, he says, it's real interesting, he says, but each person should carry his own load. And we're going, is Paul schizophrenic? A minute ago, he said, bear each other's burdens, and then he's telling me to carry my own load. I don't understand. Back in ancient times, every traveler had a backpack that he carried with his day's supplies. And everybody going on journey was expected to carry their backpack. But if they were overwhelmed, if they had a big load to carry behind, besides the backpack, Paul was saying, when your brother has an extra load, you come over here and you help him pick up that big box because it's more than he can carry. So I think what Paul is saying to the Skillman Church right this morning is, you got your backpack that you're carrying and you're doing a great job. The question would be, would you accept some help from someone to help you carry the load for just a little while? Number three, if the first one is a decision of the will, the second one is accepting some help. The third one is related to um, a dream, a vision. I'm going to call it um, that motivates people. I would take some time, if you decide you're going to relaunch and go forward, the next thing I would spend some time looking for, I just call it something that's going to turn your crank. Something that's going to get you excited about ministering here. I don't think it's enough to say, we want to relaunch just because we don't want Skillman to die. 
That's hanging on by your fingernails. I think there's going to have to be something burning inside of this congregation that goes, there's a need out there in the community, and that is what's driving us, and we want to be there, and we want to be a part of that. You go looking for that dream, that new dream that connects. That's what I would do. Next one. Oh, here's the one you hate. You knew I was going to talk about this. He keeps bringing up that C word. Change and innovation. Uh, you all like stability. Your change and innovation scores were 39 and 42. You all like stability, which is great. In order to relaunch, you're going to have to embrace change. And I've just got to tell you, that is not going to be comfortable at times. Um, I don't know how to say this other than to be blunt. You're going to change one way or another. You will either change by choice, this is who we want to become, or change will be thrust upon you because you run out of resources in 2025. Change is coming. You can either grab hold of it and be somewhat instrumental with it, or it will simply occur to you. The second thing that I need to say to you very kindly about this is, I talk to my clients about what I call low board change and high board change. When I was growing up over in Lockwood, I went to swim at McCree Park, and we had two uh, big pool, and we had two boards there. One was the three-foot board, so I was, I was scared. So you walk up to the end of it and just go, boop, and off you go. Low board change. Churches tend to do low board change. Oh, we'll do a little bit this year, then we'll do a little bit this year, and then we'll undo it and not do it, and then we'll do a little bit more. And over a period of 15, 20 years, they do enough low board change to keep up. What you all, then there was the nine foot, the nine foot board, which was, oh my gosh, we're floating for a while, and then I hit the water. What we're talking about here, to be perfectly honest with you, is not low board change. We're talking about high board change. It's going to occur in a short period of time in a significant way, and the church is going to have to make a pretty big shift pretty fast. It can be done, but you've got to know you're going off the high board. Does that make sense? And we've got to go off together. So me and Geraldine are going to grab hands and we're going to go off the board together. And on the way down, here's the next piece of it. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are the people that walk into the world and walk into the, walk into the room and automatically appreciate. Oh, I like the walls and I like the plants and I like the singing. We're just automatic appreciation. Life is good. There's also those folks at the other end of the pole that automatically critique. Don, did you know that uh, your button was undone this morning? And did you know that slide uh, that you just did, number six, was out of order? And some of y'all noticed that, didn't you? And then, and they're automatically critiquing. If we are going to relaunch in a short period of time off the high board, I need all of the automatic critiquers to turn the volume down. Because we're going to have to go positive, not go negative. Does that make sense? It's not going to work any other way. And I'm just being as honest with you as I love you guys to death, but those of you that automatically critique, I need you to hush, as my mother would say. It ain't going to work. Innovation. Embracing innovation. Finding a niche for this church to connect with the community. There's all kinds of opportunities. Um, your next, they tell me you're next door to the second most used public park in the city of Dallas. There are dogs everywhere and people walking. Every time I walk over here, some people do a service ministry. So they're out there with tables and donuts and coffee, and they're handing out coffee and donuts, and I would do doggy treats. Half of Lakewood would be here. And they're making relationships and friends. It's innovation. 
It's changing the way we approach. Because most people are not going to just come in, walk down, sit down at church. There's going to have to be a connection. There's a church that Lisa and I visit at in Houston when we go down there, that they have a big parking lot like this, and they have a food market with vendors on the weekend. And there are people up there, and there are people at that church that are out there meeting them. It's connecting. You've got a lovely auditorium over here uh, that's not being used. Mark and I have talked about this. What if you gave that auditorium to kids getting married in Dallas that can't afford a church wedding? And you say, we want you to come here and host your wedding here. And then you offer them premarital counseling. Uh, and then we have a class on Sunday morning about marriage and say, come on back for that. What works? I don't know. But it's giving the church permission to be innovative and to make some changes and to reach out and connect with the community. Because it's just not going to happen the way it's happened in most of our lifetime. Church has changed. The world has changed too much. Change innovation. Next one is a leadership core and a group of people who are highly committed to this. Um, it's going to take more than me, more than our three elders doing this. It's going to be this church coming together, rolling up its sleeves, and all of us working. Uh, we can't hire it done. It's going to be everybody doing some work. And I realize some of you have been working for years and years and years, and you're very, very tired. But it's going to take a core. I don't know how to say it other way. What I say is it's, it takes a core group of people willing to lay their bodies down on the track to make it happen. A couple of my students five years ago invited me to their church, one community church up on 121. It's a black church, and I was the only white guy attending that day. And I had a great time. And on the way out, they gave me a coffee mug, says one community that I drink out of every single week. About every week, I get a text from one community that tells me about something going on at their church. And I love this one. I get goosebumps. Once a year, someone calls me up and they say, Don, how are you doing? Is there something going on in your life that we could pray with you about? I know you got two kids that are cops. Can we pray with you about your kids? They adopted me as a member, and I attended there one time, and they've been connecting with me for five years consistently. If I were looking for a church home, which I'm not, I'm here at Skillman, y'all in my house, I would go to one community because they've put the work in, and I feel at home there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's work. The last one is going to be um, attracting a new generation. Attracting a new generation, a younger members, and turning the key leadership over to them. It's going to take attracting those millennials, and those millennials have left the church. And getting them back is going to be a slow process, but we've got to bring them back in, we've got to connect with them, and then we've got to groom them, and we've got to turn significant leadership over to a younger generation. We've got to pass the torch on, and that's got to happen. Um, and then that legacy that you love of Skillman, that torch gets passed on. But it means they're going to do stuff, and I'm going to be going, oh my gosh, is this okay? Yeah, yeah, just like my kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Those are your relaunch options, in my estimation. That's the price tag on doing a relaunch if it were done here from scratch, as I can see it. There, I'm sure there are other things. On the other side, which is the repurpose, which you basically, you look at all that and you just go, that's all interesting, that's all good, I love that, Don but we are just tired. We don't have the energy to do that. Uh, it, it's a hill too high. Well, then you look at the repurposing, which is where you basically take the assets of the church and you invest it in other ways to minister. And Skillman, as a church, ceases to exist and meet but its legacy goes on through other ministries. 
And you all have a classic one sitting here to do that. I've been in Christian education my whole life. And, and you have a marvelous Christian school here that is up and going that could partner, could begin exploring here pretty soon, exploring other Christian schools that would love to expand into Lakewood and partner with the CDC. And your legacy then, the way you make disciples, which is a part of your ministry, is not through church converting people, it is through educating the next generation of young children. And it's a worthy remissioning of the church and Skillman, though, would cease to exist. And that's an option as well. And there's probably other options to repurpose as well, but that one's sitting right in front of you. Focus groups. Uh, this, that's my, this, is my, this is my bit. You, you've heard my shtick, you've heard what I have to say. It's, it's really, it's, it's in your lap. What I'd like for you to do is, is take the next week or two and cook on this. Reflect on this. Pray about it. Don't react to it, don't go off the reservation. Just sit with it and think about it. Next Sunday, the 5th, and the Sunday after that, the 12th, at 8.30, at 1, and at 3, I'm going to be here. Sarah, my colleague, will be back. And then the elders will be here. And we're going to be over in the Fellowship Center. There's three sessions. You'll sign up in line. And we want to hear from you. Because this has got to be the church's decision. It's up to you all where we go. I'd like for you to come. Uh, we're going to give you plenty of time to talk. The sessions will be long enough where you can have your say. Uh, if you're not a talker, I'd like for you to come anyway, and I'd like for you to write down what you think. If you say, I go to group meetings and I never say anything, that's great. Come listen to everybody else and bring your thoughts in writing and give them to one of us, and we'll, we'll put it in the mix. And we're going to see if we can come out of those two weeks to some kind of consensus about where we're going as a church. And I'm going to hope we can get back to you. I'm aiming at March the 5th. So we go through February, we pray about it, we grapple with it, we talk about it, and see, coming back to you at March 5th, where we are as a church. And that's what we'd like to do. I'm going to take off my consultant's hat and put on my theologian's hat for just a second, and we're through. When I was thinking about all of this, I woke up in the middle of the night and it dawned on me a verse. It's one of my favorites. Over in Hebrews, it talks about how that we should always entertain strangers. For many have entertained angels unaware. Don't you love that verse? Now let me tell you what that verse is referencing because I think it has something to say to us. It's referencing the promise made to Abraham. God appeared to Abraham and he said, I'm choosing you to have a great nation. You will have a great name. You will have descendants like the multiples of the sand on the seashore. And through you, all nations on the earth will be blessed. And he said, your wife is going to give birth to a son. And he promised him a boy. And you know the story that Abraham waited and Sarah waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. No son ever came. And finally they got old. And they gave up on that promise. Oh yeah, God said this, but nah, it ain't going to happen. And one day, Abraham looks out on the distance, and there are two angels walking along with the Lord. And he runs to tell Sarah, he said, I need you to bake something up real quick. And he calls those old boys in, and they sit down, and they eat at meal, and then the Lord looks at Abram and he says, your wife Sarah will give birth to a son. And Sarah laughs and says, you got to be kidding me. That ain't going to happen. And the Lord says, I will come back this time next year and Sarah will be with child. And he said, for with God, 
all things are possible. It occurred to me that as challenging as this situation seems, isn't it interesting that the entire salvation history story started with a promise in elderhood? Wow. Maybe God's saying something to us. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so thankful for the Skillman Church. I'm thankful for its love uh, of you through the years. I'm thankful for all its good work that it's done. And thankful for the good work that's going on right now. I'm thankful for these people that have been uh, loyal and faithful to this congregation. And I pray that you'll give them wisdom and strength as they grapple with the things that they are facing uh, because they want to glorify you with their lives and with this church. You've promised that if we pray for wisdom, you'll give it. And so that's our prayer today. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
But I will 